Black Magic Woman podcast acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this episode on. We also acknowledge traditional owners of the land where you, the listener or viewer, are tuning in from. We would like to pay our respects to our elders past and present and acknowledge that this always was Aboriginal land and always will be Aboriginal land. This episode is proudly brought to you by ANZ, a new series of conversations with different mob around the country to yarn about meaningful career opportunities within ANZ, building the capacity of Indigenous businesses and organisations, and helping individuals in the broader community to achieve financial well-being and resilience. Welcome to the Black Magic Woman Podcast with Mandanara Bales. Welcome back to another amazing episode of the Black Magic Woman. This is my partnership series with ANZ. My amazing guest is joining me here on the lands of the Gadigal peoples here in Sydney. This is my mother's country. My family go back seven generations to Gadigal country. I want to acknowledge not only the Gadigal, but the 28 groups that make up the Sydney Basin, also referred to as the Eora Nation. So my guest today is Catherine Gibson, who I met on Ghana Country. Yes. And we're now reuniting on my mother's land. We actually met at an ANZ IBA sponsored business kind of boot camp at UniSA. So we'll talk about that. So look, for all of my guests on the podcast, I always hand over the microphone. I think you're the best person to introduce yourself. So can you please share with my listeners? And also we've got viewers on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you for joining and watching uh, and supporting this podcast. Your name, your mob, and maybe just a little bit about where you grew up. Sure. Great. Thanks, Mandanara. Um, Catherine Gibson. I'm a proud Darug woman. I grew up on the Central Coast, so uh, Central Coast is 90 minutes north from here at a suburb called Womberal, but whenever I say Womberal, everyone's like, oh, never heard of that, and then I say, Ter oh, it's close to Terrigal, and a lot of people are familiar with Terrigal, so yeah. I currently live uh, on Shelley Beach, which is in between Terrigal and the entrance, so it's right on the coast, and it's a, a beautiful place, so I haven't ventured too far. Um, still in the same still neighbourhood. Still in the same, pretty much the same neighbourhood, but it's on beautiful dark and young country. And uh, I head office for works at Telgra, so it's really convenient and a great place to, to raise a family. I'm married. I've been married for, I think, 23 years this year and have uh, two girls, uh, 10 and 6, so they keep me super busy. Well, first, you know, the, the main thing that I like people to kind of get an insight into, what what has it been like in terms of growing up as a Darug woman? Yeah. Well, it's been a really interesting journey for us. It's only a relatively short journey of really understanding our connection. So many years ago, probably 45 years ago, Dad had started our family uh, history and he's always been interested in family history. So researching all different lines and, you know, where people came from and, you know, really understanding your roots. And at the time he found a lot of roadblocks with a certain channel. So everyone had like a little manila folder with, um, you know, their paperwork and, you know, he was working his way through. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that he thought, oh, you know, I'll pick, pick that hobby back up again and opened up the filing cabinet and pulled out the first manila folder. And he was like, oh, I got stumped on this one because a lot of the records were missing, missing information. And it was just back then too hard without the internet. And, you know, he'd be traipsing down to Sydney looking at records, electron or, you know, scans. State library. State library. And the archives. Exactly, the archives. Earth, deaths and marriages. Yep, all of that. This is yep. fascinating. Yeah. Tell me more. So then... Um, he pulled out the folder and then he started doing more research because with the internet and a lot more information, it then led him to the channel of speaking to other family members and filling in the gaps. So it, we were always under the impression the my so it was my dad's father's family line is is where the Darug yeah, yeah. Uh, heritage comes in, and he. he had never known his grandfather. He was always told that he died, and my grandfather never knew. His dad, he was just said, look, he died and he pretty much didn't exist. So there was always that missing, missing link. And my grandfather was raised by his grandmother because his mother um, had some issues and, and she wasn't capable of looking after him. 
So after a lot of, I guess, searching and information, it led to finding our Darug family. And my great-great-grandmother was one of the last surviving Aboriginal women on the Holsworthy Barracks and on the Georges River. And we found a lot of articles that related to her regarding um, commissioning the board to try to get a boat. Uh, she was married to an Australian man. Um, it was denied at the time, but just all this interest is kind of unraveled and kind of learning. It's interesting because my dad has always had such a strong connection to Aboriginal uh, culture yes. and we always found it I'm getting quite interesting. Yeah. all over my body, my whole body. Yeah, it's really, um, so our home has always had beautiful artwork pieces. He's always travelled a lot around Australia and come back with, you know, different artefacts and or we'd always He's be always been drawn yeah. to Aboriginal culture. Yeah, and our work boardroom was always, we always had multiple pieces of Aboriginal artwork. So it wasn't, it was just as soon as he found out he was, it wasn't like, oh, that's odd. He really did feel that instant he connection. Knew. He yeah. knew it, but he didn't know it. That's right. <laughs> so it's been, he's really embraced it and learning more and meeting different relatives, going down to different libraries. And he's found the graveside of where his family is buried wow. and all of the history that goes with that. So it's certainly, yeah. A journey. A, yeah, certainly a journey. So he's kind of bringing us all along with that as yeah, well. And, and you're been, embracing it as well. Yeah, I think it's really important. And obviously there's a lot of different lines with, you know, on the other side, we're sixth generation from a convict. And, you know, that's really interesting as well. But it's just like, um, but yeah, this is, it's just kind of all the missing yeah, pieces. This is not like, it's qu it's common. These stories with white Australian mm -hmm. families that have been here for about four, five, six generations yep. have an Aboriginal Woman, female, it's usually the matriarch or yes, like she's yep. the female, where on the family tree it's unknown. It's just blank. Yep. So I always say to people, if, if you look at your family tree and you go back two or three generations, mainly the female line. Yes. Yep. Because when they first came, the first boat, there was no women. They actually brought yep. out a whole fleet to populate the colony. Wow. So what do you think they were doing before that? Some mm. were obviously taking advantage of Aboriginal women. That did happen a lot. But there were, you know, there was actually relationships. There were people that fell in love with each other. Like my nan fell in love with an Irishman yep. in the 1940s or 50s in Redfern. Yep. But she married that Irishman as an Indian woman. Wow. She outsmarted authorities. So as an Aboriginal woman, she wouldn't have been able to marry. She wouldn't have been able to drink at the pub with her girlfriends after work. She wouldn't have been able no. to keep her children. She wouldn't have been able to work or live freely. So my nan's life, she yeah. lived a double life, you could say, that yeah. she went once she became free from that legislation and free from slavery, she became an Indian woman. And as an Indian woman, she lived a very different life until they found out she was Aboriginal, then they took my mum and her siblings away and then that cycle in terms of living in out-of-home care or being institutionalised or stolen generations has impacted my family. But we're talking about one generation ago. That's right. It's not... A lot of moved. Australians seem to think it was, you know, 200 years ago or a long time ago. We're talking about what happened within people's living That's memories. Right. So in their lifetime. You found out your darag, your dad's been on this journey. Yep. You're connecting with different parts of your family, extended family yes. and the mob. Tell me in terms of your children, how do they identify? What has it been like for them? Yeah, no, it's interesting because the girls, um, like I said, my dad's really embraced it and he's, you know, trying to share that with, with both of the girls and his other grandchildren as well. You can't push them though, right? That's right. And you don't want to push them, but I think the interest is just the different ages and, and things like that as yeah. well. So it's just... Yeah, exposing them and providing those opportunities for them of to course. learn and take it. A lot to take in, especially at a young age when you've got so much else going on and then you're dealing with with all of that yeah. as well. And, and, you know, talking about positive representation and role models, I never actually knew anyone when I was growing up that had a business. I never knew. Yeah. As a young black kid growing up in Redfern and Waterloo, I did not know that my grandmother – was an entrepreneur. She was a businesswoman. She created an art gallery with all of her Aboriginal art wow. and artefacts that she collected. Gosh. She decorated her whole house and had busloads of Japanese, Chinese, Come Korean, full-on busloads of visitors. We had the big coach <laughs> buses with 100 people. They used to pull up in my grand's house. They used to come through. She'd pull us out of school because the Murray School was in the next street in yep. West End. We'd perform. 
my beautiful Uncle Mick would play the didgeridoo and show them the breathing, right? And that was my grand's business. I had no idea, though, that that was a business. So being exposed to, you know, business as a young age didn't happen for me. How did you end up falling into business? Yeah, so it's interesting. So I work for the family business, so my parents own the business, and I always said I was never going to work there. So it's been 34 years this year, the business has been going, and when I finished school, I said, look, I'll help out, help out. You know, I remember it was before email, so I used to, uh, my job was typing the memos, so typing the memos and putting it on people's desks, so that was, you know, the office updates. And then I thought, oh, I, this is interesting. And um, I decided to stay a little bit longer. And 25 years later, I'm still in the business. Um, 25 years. Yes, 25 <laughs> years. It's actually it's very gone long. really quick. Uh, it, has, it has gone quick. It's had its moments. It's had its moments. But it's certainly um, a business that's really evolved over the years. So it's never doing the same thing. So I think that's what's been exciting about it. But I think the vision's really driven by my dad. He's very... Uh, visionary. He sees things, he sees opportunities and he gives things a go. So sometimes I'm a little bit more risk adverse. He's very like, let's just jump in and we can do this and we'll try this. I'm like, oh, so it's kind of good to have that balance. That balance. Yes. Um, but it's been really exciting, particularly over the last couple of years. Um, and since um, finding out about the, the Dara connection and the family history is we've had it really embraced it on the Central Coast and the Central Coast is a great community. There's a lot of organisations that have been really supportive of our journey and kind of helping guide us as yeah. well. And uh, one of those organisations is uh, Barra Barang Corporation and we met them a couple of years ago now um, at an event that we held for NADOC Week and they joined, um, which was great. And since then, we've kind of looked at how we can work together and particularly around um, employment for Aboriginal youth on the Central Coast and also training opportunities. So that's been really important for us over the last uh, few years on really trying to work closely with Barra Barang um, and our corporate clients and government clients on how we can really provide real social impact yeah. to our local community through employment and, and um, training opportunities. So that's been really exciting over the last couple of years to see that grow further. I was going to say now... For the listeners and our viewers, what is the business? <laughs> 25 years and you started with doing some memos yep. about the meeting. What do you actually yep. do? So it's kind of hard to put it in a little bit of a nutshell, yeah. but we started off as a print management organisation. So we are independent. So that means that we don't have printing equipment. Quite often people will turn up and say, oh, where's your printing presses and where's you know, where do you print? but we don't produce anything. So we pr purely manage. So we have supply partners locally, um, some offshore as well for um, custom uh, bespoke items. Yep. So it could be for print or promotional merchandise. Um, but we work with organisations that have a multi footprint. So it could be uh, nationally or APAC region based. And we source and procure uh, all of their product. And then we wa warehouse it and manage it. So we have a um, warehouse with 3000 pallet spaces at our Talgra head office. So a lot of the products we procure, warehouse and distribute uh, through our online portals. So we wow. build online systems and all of the um, clients can log in, we can integrate with uh, SAP um, or the ERP systems and manage that spend. So from a procurement point, they can see their spend all in one basket because there's specialist suppliers that can produce different products. So not one printer or one merchandise provider can provide a whole end-to-end -end range. Of course. You so, go to the best as well. Yeah, who's got the best price. And that's right. But being independent, so what we're really focused on um, and what we're moving forward with our, um, particularly government clients we're working closely with because we really want to build up the capability with other Indigenous-owned businesses. And because we don't have any, I guess, um, we're not wedded to our own equipment. We're not like, oh, we need to produce this because we've got this piece of equipment. We want to work with suppliers that support, I guess, our vision of what we're looking to achieve. Yeah. So really working with uh, Indigenous businesses to onboard them as part of our supply chain. So when we're working with our government clients, we can then report on spend, obviously, through EBIS Global, but then also spend a direct impact through other Indigenous of businesses course. as well. So that's what we're kind of working on at the moment, just to build and understand the capability and then um, put those in, suppliers into categories that can support our clients and we can help 
support them as well. You're right. It is such a unique business model. I've never yes. heard of it. <laughs> never heard of one, never met a business or yarned with somebody with the same business model. Yeah. So it's interesting in that the certifications yeah. really. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> you talk to people when they go, what do you do? It's like, how long do you have? Yeah, I know. yeah, pretty much. Now you can say, have a listen to this podcast. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I explain it pretty well oh. on the podcast. Yep. So talk about the, the Indigenous businesses now. So if I had a print company, right, yep. how do I be part of your supply chain? Because you would be one of the big players. If you've got government contracts and I'm a smaller Aboriginal business, yep. Is there, like, is there room for more Aboriginal businesses or Indigenous businesses to be part of your unique business model? Yeah, definitely. And that's something that we're really trying to explore and understand. So when we meet and go and interstate and travel, we want to meet and identify businesses that we can work with. And sometimes it's um, businesses reaching out to us to, to say, look, could we be on board at all? You know, we'd like to work together. But also it could be corporate clients or government clients saying, look, we would like to include these supplies in our supply chain. Yeah. But at the moment they can't handle everything, yeah. but we would like to include yeah, them. In terms of the capability. That's We're correct. limited. That's Indigenous correct. business sector in terms of most majority of small to medium enterprises yes. and need to kind of partner or do a joint venture for some, but partner to be able to take on some of the bigger clients and that's, contracts. That's correct. So we want to help, I guess, support those businesses through contracts that we're hopefully successful with as yep. well. So that's kind of where we really want to build build that up. I'm excited. Business. So, yeah, so are we. We're really excited. Um, More people need to know that businesses like your family business exist and the social impact is so important because if you don't know, there's research out there, go and look at it. For every one dollar that you spend with an indigenous business, a social impact equals four dollars forty one. Yeah. Crystal Kinsella has got an amazing book. She's got a YouTube channel yeah, called Meet the Mob <laughs> as well. But around supply diversity, indigenous business procurement, the IPP. If you've got a reconciliation action plan, a wrap. There's three thousand organisations, and A and Z have a wrap. Yes. And in their wrap, there are deliverables. So your business can support some of these organisations with their deliverables in their wrap. You can also support Indigenous people building their own capability to then go and tend to f on their own or go together. Um, there's such a knock-on effect when Indigenous businesses, like, support each other. And that's what I love about our culture. It's such a supportive, collective, inclusive yep. culture that I don't feel that we need to compete with each other. No. We need to work with each other. There's enough, you know, there's enough money. There's enough demand in this country. And there's such a big push for a lot of organisations, corporations and government departments to work with Indigenous businesses, um, which we know is self-determination in action. And it's a way that we can keep on breaking that cycle when it comes to intergenerational poverty and start looking at intergenerational wealth and Indigenous business and, you know, business and entrepreneurship excites me. And that's why I was so excited to do the one day boot camp <laughs> masterclass. We met those four Indigenous businesses sitting around a table for a whole day we and we all had our challenges. I was having a few challenges <laughs> on the day and I was getting real time support right there from the experts to sort out some of my business challenges. Yeah. What made you, or how did you get involved with that business boot camp? Yeah, so our bank manager through ANZ has been very supportive. We've um, been a customer with the ANZ for many, many years, I think from pretty much since we started started the business. And I'm really lucky, actually, our manager who looks after our relationship lives in in the same suburb as I do and our kids go to the same school. Stop. So we see each other at, at work when she's popping in. Yeah. But then also I, we pick the kids up from after school camera like, oh, hi. So it's just that real community and I guess connection piece. Yeah. Um, so they put us forward and said, look, you know, would we like to be included? And I thought, what a great opportunity. And it was such a great day, even if it was just one day, but just to step away from the business and have that concentrated time to really take everything on board and I was thinking driving actually what I actually took away from it and just even the simplest little things that I've implemented it's only been a couple and I've still got my notes from the day but just those little things that I have been able to put in place have really helped just juggle day-to-day -day challenges but also just time and time management as well so yeah. I uh, think the same for me just 
just stepping outside of the business and trying to think about the business without being in it. it. And it's so hard to do. And I am similar to you. I'm in business with my grandmother's sister. Your family, your parents own the business. Is there any plans yet for you to be a shareholder? Can you tell us anything? 25 years of service. It is, yeah, I know. We're clocking up the time. (laughs) Just saying, Dad. (laughs) So I think um, one thing is my family is very open, so there's a lot of conversations happening. You know, what's the plan? And Dad's Dad's a planner. He likes to, you know know what what's happening so there's certainly conversations happening on that front my brother's actually come on board in the business in the last couple of years as well so it's probably coming into the third year mm-hmm. uh, he used to work at t corp which is part of the uh, the treasury and um, global property investments and he had a bit of a change so it's good we're very different but we do complement each other really well so i guess watch this space but yeah it's um yeah it's an exciting time but dad's certainly very Hands on in the business, still going strong. Yeah, still going strong. Still get emails. There's and no calls no retiring and, yeah, yeah, anytime no, no soon. <laughs> so with so with ANZ, um, I'm I bank with ANZ. I have found just the fact that now there's two Indigenous business bankers. One of them looks after me. I met both of them, and I was like so excited to see a bank, one of the big four you know, take that next step and go, we need Indigenous people in these jobs. Um, And there's so many other things that ANZ do that I keep on. I keep on thinking to myself, you know what, if more people knew, especially black fellas, that they could pick up the phone and talk to another black fella that was a banker, one, there's this common, there's a connection straight away. Uh, We feel comfortable. We could talk about anything. I feel, you know, my guard kind of drops immediately when I'm talking to other black fellas. But there's this sense of pride that I get knowing that black fellas are actually, you know, employed by these big institutions. Yeah. Over the last, you know, couple of years with, with ANZ doing all these different things, is there anything else that they're doing that you've found value out of? Because there's programs, there's products, there's services that I don't even know exist yep. until I've been doing these, this partnership. I'm finding out more and more. Yeah. No, I think um, the relationship that we've had has been very open. And I think one thing that we love about working with ANZ is that they're approachable. You can call them at any time. They'll come in. It's just having that relationship and that communication. But certainly they're always looking at ways that they can work with us or provide us, um, I guess, the opportunities. So, for example, the the training opportunity in South Australia, um, the opportunity to, you know, catch up again today. I know. Um, but also the connection. So I'll meet with Alex, our contact, our uh, manager, and she's like, oh, I was speaking to head office about this today. It seems like the ANZ is so big and untouchable, but it's really not like everyone's really working together at the corporate head office level to, to the branch level. So that's what we really love. And I think for a lot of us, you know, black fellas, I'm speaking here for myself as well, that it can be a really daunting feeling or experience of trying to navigate being in business, trying to navigate the, the whole banking and technology and apps and then actually talking to a real person. You don't always get a real person yes. when you're dealing yeah. with <laughs> big corporations. Um, so I, I would agree with you mm. there. The fact that I can ring up, like I've had a few challenges yeah. and I, I knew that I could pick up the phone and have a yard. Have a conversation. I was on yeah. a Teams meeting straight away <laughs> and then I felt this sense of relief. And the fact that they've spent so much time investing in educating their entire workforce. So for us as black business owners, we know that, you know, we can actually close the unemployment gap in this country with Indigenous businesses alone. But people need to know that we exist. And that's why I'm so grateful that one, I've got a platform, you know, being in business. Number two, I started this podcast, Black Magic Woman, and now people like ANZ are seeing the value of partnering with me to get these stories out there to the wider community. So I'm so thankful that you was able to come down, make the trip, um, spend a little bit of time, share some insights about your business so that especially my um, listeners and people that I'm connected to now know that they could reach out to you. So the best way to find you is? 
Yes. So you can email me directly or reach out uh, via phone. I can leave my contact details and yeah, more than happy to to reach out and have those connections. Are you on social media? Yes. Good. Yes. So Are you on probably, LinkedIn? Yes. LinkedIn's probably the best channel. So Excellent. That's, well, yeah. of us black fellas yep. are on LinkedIn, yep. you know, corporates, corporate blacks, public it, it's servants. It's amazing. I think it's wonderful to be able to connect on LinkedIn and keep up to date on what everybody's doing and, you know, all the activity that's that's happening. So, yeah. All on, right. But I'm going to be stalking <laughs> out. I'm going to get back on LinkedIn, especially when this episode comes out, so that more, you know, not just black businesses, but I, I am a big believer that you can't, and I say this to, to people all the time, you know, don't talk the talk if you're not going to walk the walk. So here I am talking about being, you know, an Aboriginal woman in business and how much I support the sector. We, we have to keep on supporting each other, not just, hey, here's a podcast. So sharing each other's contacts, yep. maybe writing a bit of a story on our LinkedIn and even doing introductions if we can. So if there's anything I can do, thank you. don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. I would definitely love to connect you with some of the, 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 the black businesses that I know that are in this space that might benefit, might not, but it's still a connection. Right. It's still a relationship. There, if there's anything that you want to leave our listeners with and viewers, got to remember that people are watching <laughs> as well, that might be a tip for business or whatever it is, what would you like to say if you could leave, I don't know, some words of wisdom? Yeah. Well, I think you were just touching on it, but it's really about that connection, but also not competing, but working together. I think that's really important. We don't want to be competing with other black businesses. We want to be working together. So I think for us, that's what we're really driven by so yeah and employment so if there's mob on the central coast that are looking for work sing out let them know that you exist get your mum or your nan or your aunt your (laughs) uncle to reach out if you're too ashamed to pick up the phone 100 percent. but after listening to this podcast i'm pretty sure that people will know that you're there on the central coast they can pick up the phone and maybe get their son or daughter a job how deadly to wrap up the episode with opportunities and i think it's so important that we as black fellas, you know, do as much as we can to support our community and give other people opportunities. We're in the position that yep. we're in now and we can afford those opportunities to the next generation. So on that note, Catherine, thank mm-hmm. you so much for coming and being a guest on this podcast. And I so, you know, thanks to ANZ for also making this happen. Yes, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Good. Look, you mob, I hope you've been enjoying the ANZ Partnership Series. There's more episodes to come. But until next time, bye bye for now. If you'd like to know more about how ANZ can help improve your financial well-being or help you start, run or grow your business, visit ANZ.com or call 131314. A big shout out to all you Deadly Mob and allies who continue to listen, watch and support our podcast. Your feedback means the world. You can rate and review the podcast on Apple and Spotify or even head to our socials and YouTube channel. And drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. The Black Magic Woman podcast is produced by Clint Curtis.